and welcome to Fifth Gear Europe, the show which brings you the most exciting and informative motoring stories from across the continent. In this episode... Sabina Schmitz is in Germany driving the latest version of Porsche's legendary 911. I love it. Johnny is in Moscow visiting Europe's biggest car sales centre. I think I found what I was looking for. It's a larder. I drive Renault's hot new Super Mini. Ooh. The Twingo Renault Sport. And Frank Jacobs is in Holland taking a look round Europe's biggest classic car dealership. Look at that. Lamborghini Espada, my own childhood dream. There isn't a car in the world that shows the benefits of evolution more clearly than a Porsche 911. For over 40 years, Porsche have been refining the design. And this is the latest version. When it was first released in 1964, it really shouldn't have worked. The engine was behind the wheels and the gearbox under the back seats. So there was nothing holding the front down. But Porsche stuck with it and slowly the 911 evolved into one of the most addictive driving cars in the world. And while it may not look it, this new one is possibly the biggest jump forward yet. In fact, instead of it being an evolution, some parts of this revised car are a revolution. The PDK gearbox is the most obvious change. Means this is the first ever Porsche with a double clutch, with a push button and instant gear change. It's also the first ever Porsche with a direct injection engine, which brings some welcome improvements in terms of exhaust emissions and fuel economy. The Carrera S can do 100 kilometers with around 10 liters and emits 240 grams per kilometer of CO2. That's even better than a Passat R36. But the new direct injection engine isn't just designed to keep the trees green. It's about speed. Even the base spec 3.6 liter Carrera will get to 100 kph in less than 5 seconds. But the Carrera S with its bigger 3.8 flat 6 engine is even faster. Fitted with the additional options of launch control and PDK gearbox, it will hit 100 in 4.3 seconds and go on to a top speed of 302. And I think it has the best throttle response I've ever experienced in a 911. I thought the direct injection would have changed the feel of the car, but it still feels perfect. The torque in this car is what I like most. 420 Newton meters at 4,400 RPM. Ooh, wow! Come sideways! Ooh, I love it! It's all adding up to exactly how a 21st century 911 should be. Fast and economical. And let's not forget about the handling. While the new engine and gearbox are clearly the headlines, Porsche have worked hard to give this revised 911 a more stable front end. The Carrera S comes with Porsche's stability management and active damper system as standard. But clearly they've done more to the suspension and also they won't say exactly what they've done. When it's in sport mode, I think this is the best handling two-wheel drive 911 ever. It's really good balance, especially in tight corners. Really feels good and it turns in way better than the former model. So these little progressions have again made the 911 complete and at 93,000 euros it's well priced. But what about the biggest revolution of them all, the gearbox? As a racing driver, I am used to proper racing gearbox, sequential gearbox. But here, there's one problem. They change the direction. So usually you pull if you want to take a gear higher. But in this case, it's totally different. You have to push and that confuses me a little bit. So you really have to concentrate on what you are doing when you change gears. It's always the wrong direction. Even with the push button, you have to push when you go faster and when you slow down, shift gears back, then you have to, to push the other way. I think you need a lot of practice to get that right. 
It's the same arrangement that Porsche used on their previous Tiptronic automatic gearbox. But it's time they abandoned that way of thinking and adopted a more instinctive system. Why have they done that? I haven't got a clue. If you get the gears right, they are really quick in changing because of the PDK gearbox double clutch. The next gear is already in. It just moves over into the next gear. And it's really fast and you can adjust it as well with the Sports Plus button. Then it's even quicker. Wow! So, the evolution of the 911 has made it a quicker, more efficient and better handling car than ever. But the revolutionary twin-clutch gearbox needs more work to match the rest of the car. The rest of the car is brilliant. I love it. I love the engine. I love the suspension. Everything is really nice, except the gearbox. That makes me crazy! Hopefully, it won't take another 40 years to make the controls work properly. Until the next version comes out, I'd have to buy a manual. Welcome to Major City. This is the biggest car dealership centre in the whole of Europe, and it truly is epic. It's 15 minutes outside of Moscow and occupies 12 hectares. There's nearly 5,700 square metres of showroom space, and it's estimated between 25 and 35,000 cars will be sold from this site in the first year alone. Now, the price of oil going up has meant that car sales around the world have gone down. But in Russia, where they happen to have loads of oil, everyone's getting richer. Disposable income has doubled in the last five years. And guess what they like spending their money on? Cars. Around 50% of people in Western Europe have a car. But in Russia, that figure's nearer to 20%. This place is designed to let them catch up and make the whole car buying experience a lot easier. No less than 11 big players operate out of seven giant buildings. So comparing a car is just a stroll away. It's utter genius. If you live near Moscow, it's like having a permanent motor show right on your doorstep. But the trump card lies up there above these two dealerships, because whilst Dad can get excited counting cup holders and talking tyres, the rest of the family can hang out in the major mall. Dobre Utra. Up here, we've got two cinemas, a bar, an internet cafe with 40 computers, a beauty center and hairdresser, a play park, a remote control car track, and a gadget shop. And thanks to the dealers, all of the entertainment facilities are free. Right, I've come down into the belly of Major City, and this is the department where they just bring all the trade-in cars, all the Partexes. If someone's gone and bought a new car, they wanted to trade their own in because maybe they're too lazy to sell it, this is where it comes. I mean, I, see, I'm under the impression, or I was, that you'd expect to see a lot of really old, you know, quite rubbish Russian cars, but actually, I've got everything. Chrysler 300C. Wow, I've got to have a look at that. That's the V6. It's actually the worst engine. Can't see any larders at the moment, no Volgas. Oh, VW Touareg. Is it the V10? No, it's the V6 diesel, but non, not a shabby car. I think I found what I was looking for. Oh, and it's got a spoiler. It's a larder. I can't even read what model it is. It's a 1500cc. Ah, oh, the interior looks like it's been woven out of duck feathers. It's got no hubcaps. This is this is true poverty spec. Six thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars U.S. dollars. So that's uh, well about six thousand eight hundred euros. Six thousand eight hundred euros. Well, I wonder what they traded it in for. I wonder if they drove out in a brand new Porsche Cayenne turbo. This year, Russia is expected to outsell every car market in Europe, with an estimated 3.3 million cars sold. Now, that is an incredible amount, but when you see places like this, which takes the concept of buying a car and turns it into a sort of family theme park event, it's kind of easier to understand. Still to come on Fifth Gear Europe. I'm in France testing a tiny new hot hatch, the Twingo Renault Sport. It's really good fun. And Frank Jacobs drives one of the world's most beautiful and sought-after classic cars.
During a recent completely unscientific survey, I discovered that A, around 65% of statistics are completely made up on the spot, and that B, Renault is most famous for building brilliant, cheap, fast hot hatches. Think about it. We've had the Renault 5 GT Turbo, the Clio Williams, the 172, the 182, the 197. Every single one of them a peach. I actually hold Renault Sport in the same high regard as I do BMW's M Sport division. They seem to be able to ferret the best from every chassis, massage the very best from every engine they use. They make superbly balanced cars. But surely this is going to put that glorious reputation at risk the Renault Sport Twingo. What on earth are Renault Sport playing at? How are they going to make something fizzy and fiery out of the weediest, smallest Renault on sale? Well, for a start, they get rid of the weedy small bits. So it's out with the asthmatic 1.2 engine and in with a far meteor 1.6 that produces 133 PS. Now, I know that doesn't sound like much, but in a car that weighs as much as a child's roller skate, it should be enough. There is, however, only one way to find out. OK, so the engine's a bit gruff, but it seems to enjoy a little bit of abuse, and the whole car's got this kind of tough, buzzy little vibe about it. It can nip, look. It can dart, and you can absolutely thrash the nuts off it, and this car just feels like it enjoys it. Not to 100 kilometers an hour takes 8.7 seconds, and top speed is 200 kilometers an hour, which is okay if not exactly electric. But I do have one very big issue with the Twingo. In a word, build quality. Oh, all right then, that's two words. Just look at the plastics on this dash top and door cards. Listen. They are frankly terrible. It also makes the car very, very noisy at speed. There's a couple of other big issues as well. Every time I go around a couple of decent corners, the cowl on this dash top is working itself loose. And this morning, I got in the car, turned the key, and it snapped in half. Frankly, I'm not that impressed. But you can almost forgive the car when you find the right sort of road, mainly because Renault Sport are magicians with chassis setup. This little car may not be about out and out performance, but it is about great handling. In standard form, the Twingo Renault Sport costs about 13,000 euros. However, this one has the optional cup chassis, costing an extra 750 euros, which gets you stiffer dampers, lower ride height, and low-profile tyres. But if you're going to get a Twingo 133, then really, you have to get this little bag of go-faster bits. It makes the car tighter, tauter, more responsive. Look, just fling it into a corner, and everything seems to hang together really well. It reveals more about what the front tyres are doing, where the grip is, and more importantly, where it isn't. Body control is really good. Look, check it out. Though it can get a bit sort of bouncy over rougher roads. The thing is, when you really start to push, you forget the niggles and start to think that this Renault Sport Twingo could be the answer to downsized motoring thrills. Whoa! Without the downsized adrenal gland. It's really good fun. This could be the future of performance cars. In these fuel-conscious times, we may have to sacrifice top speed for the thrill of great handling small cars. The only problem with the Twingo 133 is that when you stop, you touch the crappy plastics, you notice the bad build quality, the lack of equipment, the lack of sound insulation, and you thump down from planet good mood to planet vaguely disappointed. No matter what good work Renault Sport have done with the chassis, they couldn't change the very basic DNA of their starting point. And I'm sorry, but the attention to detail just isn't there. I'm about to show you a car showroom like no other. Hidden away in the heart of the Netherlands, it's a cluster of buildings packed full of cars that will literally make your jaw drop. It's called the Gallery in Brummen and it's the biggest classic car dealership in the whole of Europe. 
Nick Aldering is the co-owner of a business which has customers from all over the world. Chevrolet Corvette split window, mm -hmm. one of only three original Dutch delivered cars. And if Nick doesn't already have your dream car in stock, he will find it for you. Any model, any color, any year, any price. This Ferrari 250 GTE was previously owned by the King of Morocco. How did this story of the gallery start? The, gal the gallery started 30 years ago. My father started the business, so that would be uh, beginning 70s. It started out as a, as a, uh, as a hobby. Uh, and over the years it has evolved in this, what you see here now. He started out with uh, Alfa Romeo, later on some English cars to it. And the firm grew over the years. And now we're running the, the business together for over 12 years. Oh, what, what makes the gallery special and different from other classic specialists? The gallery offers a wide range of cars in all different, in different price ranges. And we actually own the cars. So that means there are no commission cars yet. I understand. Yeah. Where, where do you find these cars? Why do you start searching? Uh, my father does the buying pit, travels a lot all over the world. We buy and sell all over the world. And on an average day, like today, how much is your whole stock worth? Uh, you were talking about approximately 10 million euro. 10 million euros. And what's the most expensive car you've <laughs> ever sold? The most expensive car would be a Bugatti T35. And when it was sold, it was sold for 1.2 million euro. 1.2 million 1 euro 2. for a car. <laughs> But the great thing about the gallery is you don't need to be a millionaire to find something interesting and affordable. Like this Saab Sonnet. Buying a classic car might seem very expensive, but look at this sign. The previous owner spent 40,000 euros on restoring this car and now it's on sale for 21,750 euros. So that's a bargain. This is a very rare car. It's actually made in Holland and I'm afraid that the name will ring a bell. It's called the Gatso and it's weird to see that the man who spent his life building fast cars later built a machine to stop us from enjoying fast cars. Only two were ever made, so it will cost you 148,000 euros. Look at that. Lamborghini Espada, my own childhood dream, hidden away in the furthest corner of this basement. For just 36,000 euros, I could live that dream. There are over 250 cars in this building. But just in case you can't find anything you like, then there's always Nick's shed where he has another 200 cars tucked away. This stunning 1961 Facel Vega HK500 is one of only 500 ever made. It's for sale for 85,000 euros. During the late 50s and early 60s, this used to be the fastest four-seat production car in the world. With its 5.8 liter V8 from Chrysler, this car could achieve a maximum speed of over 220 km per hour and accelerate from 0 to 100 in 8.5 seconds. This Rolls Royce was completely rebodied by the previous owner at the cost of 200,000 euros. Everything that was once chrome is now gold plated. It's sold again and it goes back to where it came from. The Middle East. There's so much to distract you that I almost forgot the most important element of buying a car. The test drive. This is a 1964 Ferrari 250 Lusso. It's glorious and very, very expensive. The Lusso has Ferrari's 3 liter V12 engine, producing around 250 PS and reaching a top speed of 240 kph. Although it's almost 50 years old, this car with its beautiful Pini Farina design and V12 engine is still as amazing as it used to be back in the 1960s, and perhaps even more amazing.
You know, Steve McQueen used to own one of these. He used to take it out on high-speed trips on the Californian roads, and that's just how cool this car is. One thing is sure about Nick, he is a very trustful man, because he's been snowing here a few days ago. It's slippery, it's wet, it's winter, it's scary, and still, he lets me drive it. The Ferrari is new to the Brummen collection, but I doubt it'll stay here for very long, even with a price tag of 600,000 euros. You can spend hours, even days, walking around here and never get bored, because around every corner there's something new and exciting to catch your eye. Okay, now I want to drive that one, and that one, and then that one. And then I want to remortgage my house and buy that one.